Welcome back to the Pilots Lounge. On today's episode, we are down at the HAI Helicopter Association International Heli Expo and hanging out with the Flight Suit Friday podcast crew. The Flight Suit Friday guys are a couple awesome Coast Guard aviators who share with us a myriad of stories from rescues to how general culture is in Coast Guard aviation. And we want to give a shout out to GoCoastGuard.com for sponsoring the booth. They had an amazing recording set up, and we are very grateful to be able to collaborate with them and bring you their stories. Be sure to head over to anywhere that you get your podcasts and check out Flight Suit Friday's. Really cool guys, really awesome stories, and they're doing some amazing things. We also want to give a huge shout out to Shot Over Systems, who sponsored our ability to be at the HAI Expo. Shot Over Systems designs and manufactures high-performance gyro-stabilized camera systems coupled with the most advanced and easy-to-use real-time augmented reality mapping system and mission management software. We had an incredible opportunity to sit down with Robert Kubis, the VP, uh, or one of the VPs at Shot Over, and he described to us and explained to us some of the amazing features of their M2 multi-mission sensor, as well as their other systems spanning from the public safety sector to the defense sector and homeland security, all the way to aerial cinematography. If you want to learn more about Shot Over Systems, go to shotover.com and take a look at what they have to offer. You don't know, maybe some one of their systems will fit the mission set for your organization. And last but certainly not least, we do typically run the Hangar Z podcast bit. However, we're going to give them an individual shout out. Uh, big thanks to Jeff and John with the Hangar Z podcast for linking us in with some amazing individuals for the HAI Expo. If you want to learn more about, you know, the mission behind public safety and the equipment that they are using, check out www.hangerzpodcast.com. They have some amazing content. And if you like our podcast, we know you're going to love theirs as well. Again, that is the Hanger Z podcast, www.hangerzpodcast.com. Diving into today's episode, we do want to let our listeners know there is a slight change in from our typical audio quality because we were recording in the middle of an expo, which was still an incredible booth, and we did our best to eliminate the background noise. However, we know you're still going to enjoy the episode. From wherever you're listening, sit back, grab your cup of coffee, and thanks again for joining us on the Pilot's Lounge in collaboration with Flight Suit Friday. Because... We stole all these sound bites. Yeah. And we have paid no Pay royalties or anything. It's a Mick Jagger. <laughs> yeah. Can't yeah, use those. We had to shut down the podcast. Mick Jagger sent us a cease and desist for a, <laughs> a five second intro video. Right. Just one more copyright strike on our YouTube. It's okay. We just, at least it's not Brett this time. Um, but welcome, guys. We are here at the 2023 Heli Expo presented by Helicopter Association International. A huge, th- a huge thanks to the U.S. Coast Guard for sponsoring this booth, along with Flight Suit Fridays, which we are here with today on this sick What's little up, collaboration. Guys? So welcome, guys. Hey, or actually, it's more good so morning. we appreciate us being able to be here. This is sick. Yeah, uh, I'm just I'm just interested or so interested to talk to you guys and uh, also hear thank you to the Coast Guard from some Army guys. Like, does that hurt a little bit? Like, no, I love the Coast Guard. <laughs> yeah, man. yeah. We, we love what you guys do, especially because it's I don't know. We, we We've had. Like I said, uh, Captain Baldessari, yeah. and just that one time, or a little bit of time spent with him, just showed how, not deficient, but like just how different the jobs are and the yeah. mission sets, and it's very eye-opening. Oh, yeah. And I think there's a lot of respect that, um, not as, not as you, that you don't demand, but is demanded from, you know, your community and just knowing what you guys do. It's, it's wild. Yeah. So. Definitely yeah, a different that's... mission set. You guys do some crazy shit, though. <laughs> Lo- love me some Army flying, man. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about, uh, before we dive into everything, can you tell us a little bit about flight suit Fridays and, yeah. and you know, what your, what your mission is, what you guys are doing? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it's Sam Haffensteiner been, uh, Coasty uh, for 14 years now. Uh, and then flight suit Friday started in 2020, uh, I think. Um, so we, as an organization always have, uh, weekly pilot meetings that we really, um, like everybody gets together. Uh, we all crack beers and it's an opportunity for people to say, Hey, I, I did this bonehead thing. And like, we have a really good culture where you can just say it. And then we all kind of talk about it and then you move on. Everybody learns from it. And, uh, or you talk about like something that went well. Uh, and then with COVID, you know, you guys know, like world shuts down, like we can't get together. Uh, and so Ryan, our producer, uh, he came to me, and he's like, Hey man, I think this would be a cool idea. And I was like, 
fuck no, dude. I'm gonna, <laughs> sorry, like, I can't swear on this podcast or what. But like, I, I'm like, dude, I that's that's way too nerve wracking for me. And he convinced me, and, and that's kind of how it got started. So we just really are trying to tell some Coast Guard aviation stories, and we started to branch out, like any kind of aviation stories, yeah. trying to promote CRM, safety, all that kind of good stuff, lessons learned. It's been a lot of fun. And my boy Nick over here is uh, he's jumping in on the pod. So Yeah. Hey, good morning. Um, Nick Litchfield. i uh, been in the Coast Guard for a little over 16 years now. Uh, currently a pilot at uh, Aviation Training Center Mobile. And I get the privilege of filling Sam's shoes here um, pretty soon when, Real small you know, shoes, when dude. he decides <laughs> he's going to, uh, you know, uh, basically fall on with his career goals. Um, but yeah, looking forward to it. It's cool. You know, it's a cool opportunity to sit down and chat with folks, get different perspectives. Uh, my biggest, uh, my favorite thing is probably just, just, just uh, getting a glimpse into different people's perspectives too. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. And, you know, a little bit about us, obviously, uh, Spencer, if you want to roll off, since you can kind of give the backstory of how things came about with Bro Italian, and yeah. then we can talk about where the podcast came from. Yeah, I mean, um, we really just started as a simple social media page back in like 2015 before Instagram is what it is today. Uh -huh. um, just sharing pictures of like pilots and crew chiefs and helicopters and shit that we thought was cool. Cool stuff. And highlighting it. Yeah. Um, and just started, started growing like a small following from there and then, you know, sort of recognized that like honestly like culture in army aviation is lacking compared to like our sister branches like yeah exactly what you described in the beginning of this conversation getting together on friday and like having beers at the office and like learning from each other and stuff that is sort of like gone by the wayside in a lot of organizations so yeah. figuring out ways to improve the culture and like bring some of that stuff back call sign parties some of those types of things um and one of the things we recognize that we didn't really have is like a way to express ourselves through apparel or whatever. A lot of the stuff was kind of like overly patriotic, like, you know, throat punch donor <laughs> and like yeah. know, shit like that. It's like grunt style. Dude, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really like, you know, that's great. If you want to wear it, it's, everybody's got their own vibe, but that's not like really what we roll with. And yeah. so we got the idea to start just doing, you know, aviation inspired uh, apparel and stuff. And then um, around early 2020, we got the idea to do the custom apparel side of the house. And so that's really about like probably 60% of our revenue comes from the custom side. And then we do like the branded stuff, spinoffs, like the half from like inspired by the nineties. Yeah. Like, I like stuff it, man. Like that. Yep. So yeah, that's, that's how it started. And, um, Nick approached us, what, 2019? Was, we think we started in 2019 or 18. Yeah, I don't know. Cause was, I was in Florida. So I think yeah, 2019. Was, were yeah. you guys stationed together? No. Yeah. So my buddies oh, okay. and I that started at Brotalian were Nick, just reached out to us kind of in the blind about the podcast. Yeah. Um, if you want to take it from there, man, that's. Yeah. You know. So it's kind of interesting at the time I was working on a company that ended up just not really coming to fruition with a mixture of things. One, because of COVID two, you know, I was in and out of doing stuff with work, but I was designing an e-board and trying to do all this stuff and just was kind of a mess. I didn't really know what I was doing, but yeah. Um, you know, I knew, obviously knew what Brotalian was at the time. And I approached them because I was like, hey, this would be mutually beneficial as a, a media form for one, advertising to like, you know, bringing people stories, but also sharing something with them. And in return, like you're not really putting an ask out there, but you're, you know, you have a product. So, you know, they're going to look at it. Yeah, about visibility. Absolutely. Well, uh, obviously, like that whole thing just went away. I ended up kind of just doing the podcast thing. Uh, they, you know, we had the conversation. I was like, I don't really have this like company thing I'm doing anymore, but we're still running the podcast. Like, do we just want to make this part of Brotalian? And so, you know, we ended up just swallowing it and kind of came on with the team. And then here we are, you know, years later and, you know, I'm doing full-time media work, you know, for, for Brotalian Bro Bro and the yeah. company. And so it's kind of cool to see the, the progression and, and how things change. And uh, it's a big testament to, you know, Spencer and Brett, uh, to kind of their overarching goal. And, you know, we, we say to people that the, the focus of Brotalian is really to be able to, to make the foundation happen, the Blue Skies Foundation. Right. And the mission behind that, which is, you know, supporting families of, you know, Gold Star families of Army Aviation. Yeah. Um, so aside from that, uh, you know, kind of an enduring goal that they have, and I'm a product of, or, you know, my position is a product of, is helping aviators and people in the military make that transition out into the civilian world um, that's huge, dude, which it's been, uh, it's been a process, you know, I know we, yeah. we talked a little bit about it yesterday. We had a guy named Josh Porter, who's, you know, Sir jumps a lot on Instagram, kind of big guy. And he, he just 
had this whole big transition out as well. And so, you know, I think that is an enduring goal with the foundation as well on the back end, kind of just, that's really why we exist. And then the podcast side is a way for us to just try to connect with people and network and do exactly what we're doing right here. You know, did you have to wrangle Spencer in? Like, were you interested in doing a podcast before he came around or this? I'm not a very social person (laughs) (laughs) until you get a few drinks in me or I get to know you. Yeah. So if you yeah. listen to any of our shit, it's very much Nick heavy on like guiding the conversation yeah. and stuff. And I might ask like a couple questions. That's funny. I'm, I'm good for like my, your favorite dive bar at the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much all you can count on for me nice. bringing to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been a fun ride. And like you said, ultimately, like if you want to boil down a mission statement for Italian is like try and foster aircrew presence like, or like a swagger or whatever that, you know, like all aviators and stuff have and provide support to the military aviation community in whatever form or fashion, whether that's apparel that represents flight or you know helping financially support the foundation yeah. or you know career transition or just sharing knowledge like this kind of stuff so people Very can cool. learn from lessons you know whatever fits kind of in that broad space how, if it makes how sense big is your we'll company how, like personnel wise yeah, how many we're just under 10 now? we have nine okay. um so we have a a bunch of graphic designers that makes up about half of that and yep. then there's myself and brett um, Nick runs all the media and the podcast and photography and all that kind of stuff. And then Brittany helps. She's like our customer success manager and yeah. helps dial down on that. Um, Who's your social media boss? That's, that's Brett. Brett. Yeah. Okay. He's, that's he's Brett. The big social dude, man. A lot of work, right? It is a lot of work. Yeah. He's like, I'm sure Kelly <laughs> gets on to him a lot. That's his wife. Okay. Uh, Cause he's got three kids and he's like, he runs it like a full-time job, but he's also an uh, active guardsman. So okay. oh, yeah. okay. he's really yeah, running it's... like two jobs. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So his, his schedule is pretty wild. He, he sacrifices he, a lot, but he does such a great job with it. So. He stays on top of it 24 hours a day. It's, yeah. it's insane. But, you know, with that too, the, the benefit is, um, you know, it's something that we've talked about with a lot of things. There are so many automations and, and programs out there to kind of help with a lot of those things these days so yeah. you're not having to you know you can schedule posts and you know do all that stuff so it really manages a workload a, a little bit better what's now, your guys's um social media platform of choice right now instagram and tiktok okay yeah, yeah. so we're that's kind of where we are primarily and then we're focusing growth on youtube okay. really is, is the big the big growth sector like um, uh longer youtube videos are you guys doing those uh youtube are they called shorts both. we have both yeah, you yeah. Both? can talk okay. probably more strategically about it than you're I trying can, to get into the biz right now well what you, do you, this, what this, you doing this, this is yeah. what's important so <laughs> yeah. we talk about social future. media yeah i'm a luddite man okay like, so we've had i don't even have instagram on my phone oh you, yeah that's right that's yeah. good you're, for you though honestly we've had the uh instagram page for like two weeks right and you know like um sometimes um it it resonates with you know the crowd and you get a lot of followers fairly quickly i just have heard that like TikTok is the kind of the go-to place if you want to have a lot of followers and kind of um get that traction um youtube's there and then i've also heard that like instagram's kind of fallen off a little bit it's not going I, i'm anymore. not sure I, I don't know like what's your guys stance on that instagram is like it's interesting because i read a study about this a couple of weeks ago and like they pulled a bunch of millennials basically and i like, asked them about instagram and it's like everybody has it and like won't go away from it but they don't like using it yeah and it's yeah. funny like when we were talking to your friend last night she was like oh that was back in like 2016 when you would like take a picture of your food and like share it exactly and it was very authentic yeah. you know and now everything it's all business everything's like perfectly cropped and photographed yep. and filtered and everything and so it's kind of much, ad heavy as well point. yeah it's it ad heavy and built it's for sort of consumerism and stuff but yeah. at the same time you can't get away from it because there's nothing else that's really taking it over i know i and think TikTok talk is great especially for the younger generation um especially if you want to like get like a viral video or whatever so so many people on there but it's it's difficult to, I think, like advertise and community build on that platform. So I, Instagram's there's, like the, the devil that you there's know. There's really not much interaction kind of. on TikTok outside of somebody. And the, the interesting point to what he's saying too is like when you look at the next generation, this is a total like weird rabbit hole that we're kind of in right now. And it's oh, fine. Yeah. It's cool. I'm enjoying it. It's I'm like, enjoying it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing that we've talked about is like the next generation of people are that are young adults right now, they're not really, to answer your question of like where our focus is, it's strange because the the younger guys coming up or younger people coming up, you know, guys and girls aren't watching the five minute, 10 minute long videos. They're watching shorts and reels and TikToks that are like 10 seconds because that's about all their attention span yeah, exactly. is, which is like, which is very difficult. So, you know, there's a lot of strategy to us and how we're basically just like focusing our videos, two to five minutes, I would say is what we're trying to stay within because mm-hmm. much more than that, they're not going to watch it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what, 
you know, if you ever get into that, you can see how old people are who are watching. You can target your audience. There's yep. so many, there's so much analytics that go into that stuff. And, and, you know, on the business side too, it's good to know because for us, like I would have never thought, you know, we talked about this the other day. I would have never thought that for certain things like, you know, the 57 to 65 age group would be the one that's interacting with that the most. And sometimes it is, it throws you off entirely. So yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, you can kind of shape really not necessarily shape your content, but you can shape your approach to that content and how you're putting it out there. Right. Yeah. You know, cause obviously if I'm dropping F bombs and all this other stuff, there's not a whole lot of, you know, people that might connect with it in that generation or if I'm using slang that they just don't get. No cap, no cap. Yeah. If I say like yeah. no cap or What's for no real, cap? for real. Uh, yeah. yeah I, said, like, I have no idea. <laughs> Let's just hear that thrown around a yeah, lot these days. Brett, Brett, who lives on social media. Yeah, he's he has more attuned to the Yeah, he knows all dialect. the slang. He's got it. <laughs> yeah. He throws us off. He'll say things and I'm like, what? what? It's a combination of the, the shit that he's exposed to on social media and then like his weird hockeyisms being from Michigan yeah, and stuff. Because okay. they have like yeah. their own lingo. Too I know that. There. Yeah, I yeah. know that lingo. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. But so something that we uh, want to do before we like dive in and talk a little bit about some personal stories with you guys and, you know, whatever kind of you guys want to roll into. Yeah. Uh, it would be rude for us not to go ahead and mention Shot Over, uh, who did sponsor us uh, on Brotine and the Pilots Lounge side being here. And they they uh, graciously provided us with, with some opportunities. We're going to link in with them later to share with our community some of, you know, their systems that are coming out and the FLIR slash camera space for uh for rotary wing aviation and they're doing amazing stuff if i i don't know their booth number but um and this is going to be after you know when this is out anyway so it's going to be irrelevant but be sure to check out uh the youtube video that we're going to throw up as well as social media we'll get some photos up and some demos of uh of some of their new systems coming out like the k1 and the m2 uh flare and camera systems cool yeah outside of that go get them uh i think that we need to do table talk. We have to. We've already done table talk. Yeah, you guys ready for? You guys, you guys need something? Absolutely. I'm good. You good? What Are is you guys it? Doing? Oh, we got we got uh, a lot of choices of refreshments. Mimosas. Oh fuck! If you want one. Were you serious about the mimos? Yeah, they're over there. I will take you up on that. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's just we. We gotta stick with the flight suit Friday tradition yeah. here, man. Yeah, it's true. Of us I think to it, go it, your it's, home and it, not partake. You it's know? definitely something that we enjoy. Like, hey, what are you drinking? Yeah. And then like, hey, what's your favorite beer? So, where were you? You guys are out of Spokane. No, uh, I just saw you there. Incorporated out there. I live, okay. I just moved to Dallas. Actually, okay. uh, our facility is in uh, Milwaukee, but our team's all remote. So you guys are. All, all right, I was gonna yeah, say. So I live in Dallas. Dallas. I live in uh, Tennessee. You're in Tennessee. Yeah. yeah. Where? I've never been to Spokane in my life. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm up. In Clarksville, you know, outside of Nashville. Yeah. Um, Favorite brewery in uh, Nashville? Um, brewery or wise. favorite beer? I mean, like, I'm a I'm a PBR guy. If you really want to not dive into that, like, get real. Deep. Uh, to be honest, like, I don't really care for. I will say probably one of the better places I've been to. Uh, there's the Star Spangled Brewery, which is actually up in Clarksville. Thanks, it's buddy. pretty pretty you. good. Uh, Pretty good one. Um, in Nashville, to be honest, I haven't been to a whole lot of breweries. I've been to a couple of distilleries, but like Davidson. Davidson's a pretty good one. I'll throw them out there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm, a, I'm more of a bourbon guy. I don't. Oh yeah, being in yeah, being in Tennessee, that's that's a good spot. But yeah, no. Outside of that, uh, there's some good bars like Santa's Pub. We'll we'll get into this. We'll, yeah. we'll, cheers, Jen. Cheers. cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Happy to be here. Excited uh, to be with you guys. This is a great uh, transition. And so usually we do table talk, just like a couple of minutes when we bring people on, yeah. warm them up, bullshit a little bit. Uh, this is the one part I actually contribute to in the episode typically. <laughs> and I like to ask people like favorite dive bar or bar in general, like anywhere in the world. So Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Can I start? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You are a co like, cocked and loaded. I, I haven't, down I haven't been here in a while, so. but um, I used to be stationed in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And uh it was, it was great living there, but one of my favorite things to do was just travel up north, like Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire, um, Portland, Maine was really cool to travel to. The Great Lost Bear, the Great Lost Bear in yep. Portland, Maine. Yep. The Great. What is it like a lodge style bar? No, it's um, it's it's uh, just outside of downtown, um, and it's just a standard bar, and they have uh, really good food. I recommend the chicken wings. Uh, when you get chicken wings, it's like the uh, the wing and the drum combined. And they're hooking you up with like 
you know, six or eight or something. And you're just like so much food. Um, but uh, right. Allagash Brewery, do you guys like Allagash? Love me some yeah. Allagash. Okay, yeah, so Allagash that's just down the road. And then Shipyard. Uh, oh, is right. also there yeah. Pump, yeah. pumpkin head yeah. you guys probably had that yeah. Yeah. oh dude it's like straight from the source oh, um man. because those breweries are so close so anyways great lost bear portland maine man that Got was cocked and loaded dude that was yeah, good that was impressive yeah. yeah i like that place man can awesome. you tell yes <laughs> yeah i know that's awesome i was like you could like draw us a diagram on how to drive there it's from here. Like great last yeah. bar slash Nick Litchfield for a five percent off. Here. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. There's some royalties there. Yeah, that'll be fifteen dollars. They can send it to uh, Spokane, Washington. We'll pick it up. <laughs> I think mine mine's not much to write home about, but it's a good dive bar in Astoria, Oregon. It's called the Dirty D. It's the Desdemona Club. I've been to the Dirty D. <gasps> Have you been to the Dirty D? Yes. Are you serious? I'm pretty sure. No way. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, like a few shuffleboard tables, some pool tables like two dollar Rainier beers and just a really good time i mean if you like beer astoria is a great spot like fort george breweries there a whole bunch of other ones uh but yeah dirty d i think probably because we do uh sidetrack we do advanced helicopter rescue school out there for the coast guards like heavy seas rescue cliff rescue urban search and rescue um and all the instructors are in the hotel like maybe a quarter mile down the street so it's like our go-to got it so there's gotcha. a lot of a lot of good like late night hanging out yes yeah dirty d good deal man so kind of going into um before i ask the next question you're a 60 guy right nope 65s yeah 60 both are, are 65 same, yeah. yep. okay for all of our army guys that are listening what is a 65 uh, way cooler than a 60. I'll start there. Uh, <laughs> no, we're a uh, uh, little orange uh, helicopter. We're short range recovery for the Coast Guard. So um, they use that one. Like we got about a two hour endurance. So uh, we've got a lot more of those air stations along the coast. Um, and then we are the only ones that uh, can go and do shipboard deployments at the moment. So okay. like this, the 60 Mafia, when we uh, started flying 60s back way back, when was that? Like 90s early 90s yeah though to the 90s yeah so they decided to take off the blade fold tail fold that we got it from from the navy so they wouldn't have to do shipboard deployments and they're still fighting Spires and having to do shipboard yeah, deployments wild. they yeah. do not want to do it yeah so we're uh search and rescue is bread and butter um and then the 65 has two unique missions too that we do um rotary wing air intercept in uh mainly like national capital region dc area so yeah. anytime this the president goes anywhere we go with them to be the friendly like Hey, you're in the wrong spot. Uh, follow us before the Air Force comes in and and takes more uh, aggressive action. Yeah, yeah, that's and, pretty sick. Yeah. yeah, and then we do. Well, you can explain. Yeah, trying, and then yeah. Uh, airborne use of force. Um, you guys may have seen some videos of these guys, but basically they uh, they they deploy aboard the ships. Yeah, and um, they do drug interdiction type work. Mm -hmm. And they'll uh, we have uh, you know, uh, qualified gunners in the back with 50 cal and something else. And uh, their goal is to basically like monitor track drug runners. And uh, if needed, they'll shoot out the boat, the boat motors to stop them. Uh, the Coast Guard cutter will launch their small boat. They'll go arrest the guys, seize the drugs and start processing all the stuff. It's a really cool mission. That's pretty yeah. sweet. Um, the guys, uh, you know, they do deploy uh, fairly frequently. But like if there's a cool Coast Guard flying mission, I think that's the one to do. Yeah. yeah. I just remember the, the video. I want to say it was like a, at least a year ago, maybe a little bit more where the the coast guard dude Jump, I was, I yeah. was on top of the summer the oh, drug oh, submarine yeah. just beating, <laughs> beating yeah. the top of it with a hammer yeah so oh, they have yeah. these guys they go to this law enforcement academy and those are the boarding officers yeah and that guy went pretty ham on that boat oh yeah he did yeah it was oh, it's a cool video the shit it's out of the top video. of that thing yeah, <laughs> the guy's like okay okay, okay we'll this, get that, out that was really really good for gocoastguard.com <laughs> yeah, sure. oh yeah everybody always make the jokes like the puddle pirates and stuff and that video came out and they're like dude Coast yeah, Guard. Who are these guys? Well, so what's interesting too, and it's actually kind of somewhat a good segue because the first time I had ever heard really about the expanded mission sets of the Coast Guard and not even just a, like as of recently, but you know, of the years and years worth of it uh, was Chris Costa. You know, he wrote a book, he's the firearms dude. Yeah. And, you know, he talked about a lot of like the VBSS stuff and like the maritime interdiction, all like, that whole world, which was basically like the special operations side or equivalent of the Coast Guard. And I think that it was very eye-opening to a lot of people who was like, this dude's like a uh, super high speed, really, really respected shooter. Yeah. And he's like done all this wild stuff that nobody even knew the Coast Guard had involvement in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of us, m most people think we're like, you know, we clean off the uh, birds of the oil spill. Yeah. And, you know, like, <laughs> Which is, I mean, it's true. It I guess true. there are folks that do that. It is true. Yeah. But yeah. 
but yeah, we, we do a lot of stuff. Um, you know, we, we have, a icebreakers that go up north and break ice and clear channels like, like on the helicopter um well no, no it's a boat yeah well, yeah I, I, yeah i know i was like i was like okay well our, our helos <laughs> used to the, the one we f- we fly they used to do um trips all the way down to antarctica so they would do uh, our polar rollers that are up in seattle they break out down to mcmurdo sound and then they put skis on the 65 and you go out on like a six month deployment go to like australia new zealand end up down there landing next to penguins and stuff yeah that's pretty wild yeah, back in the day yeah so a little bit about you know kind of on the culture note well on a, on a day-to-day you know for for you guys how is how does your day-to-day look as you know just a line pilot in the coast guard and what is that culture at the unit like uh because obviously only being on the army side we know about 50 percent of the time maybe you'll go to pt in the morning and then you might you know go into work you might help wash an aircraft or sit behind a planning computer all day and do whatever 17 other jobs you've been assigned, you know, and bullshit with your friends while you're doing it. Um, but obviously the branches are very different. We have different mission sets as, as, as we've learned over time. Um, you guys kind of have a stateside mission that doesn't allow you to train at the same capacity or like mm-hmm. the same volume because yeah. you're busy doing a real world mission set all the time. What does that like day to day look like? Yeah, so I think that um, we could probably start by saying it's probably going to resemble maybe something similar to like a firehouse, right? Where you kind of have like a 24 hour uh, duty rotation for most of our operational units. Um, But uh, as a Coast Guard officer, Coast Guard pilot, um, each person certainly has at least one collateral duty that's going to take up a majority of their time. Yeah, exactly. Or 17. (laughs) Um, The collateral duties are fairly heavy um, sometimes, depending on where you're at. Obviously, like the smaller Coast Guard air, air station they have the same requirements for the collateral duties with uh, less people to cover them so they'll find up uh, find themselves doing some more bigger units spread out a little bit better but um, like my typical day show up uh, log into the computer check emails um, you know uh, take care of some collateral type duties and then um, you know at some point prior to the flight kind of start getting my flight bubble you know pre-flight planning all that stuff um, you know, go out for a flight and, uh, come back, probably do some more collateral work. Um, my last unit, uh, operational unit for search and rescue, um, probably between five and eight, uh, days a month, I would stand the 24 hour, uh, B zero, uh, duty and B zero is basically, Hey, uh, we want you airborne in 30 minutes. Bravo zoo, uh, Bravo uh, zero. So, um, yeah, that's, that was kind of like my typical day. Now, at uh, Aviation Training Center Mobile, it's a little bit differently because we have students coming through for uh, basically their eight-week designation courses. Uh, we have three-week uh, transition courses because we're doing the 65 Delta to 65 Echo transition. So we're teaching them on how to operate in the new aircraft. And then, of course, we have our annual uh, one-week proficiency courses that come through as well. And um, basically, you can, you can think of it as like sims, classrooms, you know, stuff like that. What's yeah. the, uh, the eight week designation course. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So these are pilots that are coming, um, either straight from flight school. Okay. Um, so our Navy flight school, they're, they're new graduates nuggets. Um, basically they'll, they'll enter either the 60 or the 65 pipeline. And, um, you know, once we have a spot for them, we'll, we'll welcome aboard and basically start the process. So, um, they'll go through lots of classes, uh, simulator events, um, lectures and of course, uh, you know, flight phases. Um, but basically the goal is to get them up and running in, uh, the, whatever specific aircraft 65 or the 60. Got it. And then when they graduate, they're going to be basic SAR qualified and designated as a, as a coast guard, you know, co-pilot for that aircraft. Um, what that allows them to do is go back to their home unit, start standing the duty with, you know, the, the, the experienced aircraft commanders, the flight mechanics and our rescue swimmers. Okay. Yeah. So they I mean, come out of flight. So go ahead. I was just going to say, it's not just the people coming out of flight school too. We, we get uh direct commission aviators over yeah. from yeah, no, army. Guys have done yeah. That. Marines, yeah. Uh, Navy. That's usually, actually, I don't know if I've ever met any air force. DCAs, no, but I, I, I think there might be one, but um, believe it or not, a majority of our DCAs are from our, the army. Our army. Yeah. For yeah. some yeah. reason, there's a big pull. Well, which is actually interesting because I know a handful of guys that applied and didn't get picked up for, you know, whatever X, Y, or Z. Most of the time they don't give them a reason, but yeah. Um, it is, it seems very competitive to yep. even go yeah. that route right now. It's, it's great because we need pilots just like every other service does. So like, if you're interested, just, you know, might want to apply again, uh, because we definitely need people, but it back to the culture thing though, too, like 
So that's your typical day. I would say like mine, I get into work. Yeah, I log in, but there's probably a reason I have 250 unread emails because then I just like social butterfly around. I think like, <laughs> to, to be honest, like I, th- and I think that's part of our culture too. Like we're, we're like, uh, it, it's just like such a small group, small family, right? Because you guys are probably at units with a ton of aircraft and pilots. Um, it depends what you, I mean, okay. a, a typical company, right? So it depends. I, I'll say that a normal flight company is going to have eight to 10 aircraft and maybe 20 pilots. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. And, that, and that's in a company. Okay. So that is have, pretty tough. You know, Small. you'll have yeah. three companies to a battalion, so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's not massive. The only, the only, caveat to that is like a medevac unit because you're going to have like five platoons and 30 el- aircraft or 20 however 15 i don't know i think yeah i think we get i think we have different. 15 i don't know um but those are larger you know you're okay. gonna, your normal company size for a flight company is only like 50 ish people though it's pretty small that is small okay I, i'll take that back because we we've got a couple units out there that have three helicopters but they've got 16 pilots just because we got a staff you know that 24 hour sure. uh you know star watch but um you guys know this too, like the culture is, it can be driven by the people at the top, right? 100%. And so like, we've got some fantastic uh, CEOs out there that like, you talk to anybody at, I don't know, Air Station Savannah right now, and they are loving life because yeah. they got a great, great command. So like that can make and break it too. But at the end of the day, there's so few of us, we all hang out together. We're all like, like lunch together is a normal occurrence. We're, we're BS and we're having a good time. We're getting our work done for sure. But uh yeah, I think the culture in our, in our organization is really good. Yep. And um, like to elaborate on the firehouse thing. So out of Air Station Savannah, they, they have an air facility up in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. Really, really cool, right? Uh, right now, currently closed down. They had a pipe burst and uh, the, they're repairing and all that. Mold everywhere. But you'd yeah. go up there, like you uh, basically uh, you do your brief, uh, crew brief um, once you're on duty. And it's a 24 hour duty, get with the crew, um, chit chat, basically fly up there. It's an hour flight, shut down, turn the plane around. Everybody's going to get lunch together. And then we go get groceries together and then we come back and then we go do like a night flight, like an awesome trainer, rescue swimmer ops, um, hoist into the, to the, the 45 foot coast guard boat in, in Charleston's Harbor, come back, turn the plane around, like cook a big, like family meal, go to sleep, wake up another big breakfast family meal you know it's just that's pretty it was cool man like it was the best way to get to know the crews um like my favorite thing dude i wake up make breakfast burritos for everybody like they enjoyed it i enjoyed it everybody got something from it it was just cool man you know what i mean yeah and you know do you find that that kind of culture is just sort of like that when you're in a unit that's pulling those 24 hour ops you know the the firehouse style culture Yeah. yeah i think it's i think it expands across uh more than just that, because like uh, part of the advanced helicopter rescue school that I'm with out in Astoria, like it's the same mentality. We we work hard all day long, like seven in the morning till like we're done. And then we're debriefing like how did the day go with all these students at like six. But we're doing it at our little shed that's next to our classroom with a Blackstone and a cooler full of beers. And we're like hanging out. We're making dinner together. So I think that like it expands uh, at least through the aviation community, like kind of wherever you are. Yeah. 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 It's fun. So something, you know, when, as you were saying that the, the, the massive difference that I definitely see with the army aviation side is I, I feel, and this is probably just my experience, but I feel like the fire, the firehouse culture and that kind of thing doesn't really happen until you deploy. Yeah. And I think that I it's really why a lot of us, like you miss that because it was so much easier, you know, your, your X, Y, or Z location, whether it's Middle East, Europe, South America, whoever, like wherever you're at. But you go to these spots and it's honestly why like I I never really minded the field. Yeah. Like for what it was. Like, sure, we all hate going to the field, but the actual going to the field, I was like, this is great because nobody messes with you. Like yeah. you're just you're just doing your job. You're hanging out with the homies. Yeah. Life 90, is simple. Yeah, 99%, especially when like when I was doing my time recently in the med and we're pulling 24 hour med ops. Like I'm just chilling there with my radio and we're just bullshitting all yeah. day. I'm like, we're, yeah. we're, then, and, you know, it's time to go. You go and you do your job. Right. And oh, you yeah. guys are but, focused on that mission at that point. Right. Like you're not dealing with like the other day-to-day administrative yeah, stuff that's going on. Whatever Correct. that collateral yeah, was. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and, but like, at least in my experience, the only time that you get that is when you're in a deployed or, you know, a longer setting field environment, you know, a short one or two day thing is usually in conjunction with some mission or training extra, like big, you know, operation. But I find that when you're usually out somewhere for more than a couple of days, 
just things become more cohesive and you, you do get a little bit more of that firehouse style. Absolutely. Culture yeah. And, well, um, one thing that we do, uh, like if we do a deployment or if we're out for a training course with the same crew, like you get to form those bonds, but, um, our normal duty rotation. So like if those five to eight duties per month that we stand, we're generally coming on with a completely different crew each time. Like it's not, it's not like, hey, these two pilots are going to be always paired with this flight mech and this rescue swimmer. Um, and, and, you know, there's probably a reason why we always rotate through people. You know, there's uh, there's no reason really to stick any one crew together the entire time. Um, but, uh, yeah, you get a little bit more of a cohesive bond when, when you spend the same amount of time with the same crew. Now, it could also go the other direction, too. You're like, I don't I don't like working with this dude, and this is going to be a terrible yeah, event. Yeah, but that- for the most part, like, Coast, Coasties are very like-minded people. Um, pretty chill, you know what I mean? Like we typically enjoy the same types of things. So like, it's easy to get along with each other. There's, there's always gonna be personality conflicts, but I don't see that very, very often in the Coast Guard. You know, I think that's something that makes the Coast Guard incredibly competitive. And and honestly, I think Army Aviation used to be very much like that before we all just started hemorrhaging pilots. But I think it was very much like a culture of acceptance of the new people into it. And I think that Coast Guard, because, you know, I, I don't know how many pilots the Coast Guard has, probably less than a thousand. Yeah, total, I think it's right? about a thousand or two thousand. That's a really good question. Yeah, I, I should don't probably know, know that. I've no probably idea. should. Yeah, but like yeah, let's say two thousand. Yeah. Right. Significantly less. Right here. Right here. Two thousand. Yeah. Right here. One thousand nine hundred ninety nine. But nonetheless, like when you're talking a smaller organization, it's not, you know, half a million people. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, on top of that too, just a, a mission set that is 24 seven, go, 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 because you're doing it all the time and you get that limited t- like training time. I think it just makes it highly competitive to like say, okay, Hey, we have limited slots. Like we need somebody who's going to come in and be able to learn, adapt, do this very quickly. Yeah. And I feel like that's a lot of like upfront judgment. And if you like, if I was in a position to interview somebody and I don't think that they can do that, or like I get that vibe that they aren't going to fit in or that they're there, like, you know, you're going to have all these other applicants. Yeah. Yeah. So that actually bring up a good point. And this is specifically for the direct commission aviators that who are interested in going to the Coast Guard. Um, So like the whole process, I won't explain it, but basically at some point you're going to go to a Coast Guard air station. You're going to sit down with a couple pilots, right? And this is the, this is the interview. And um, a lot of that's geared towards like, okay, what's your experience? Uh, You know, tell us about yourself, you know, like we're going to chit chat, do some small talk. And a lot of that's kind of just gauging who the person is and will they fit in, in this wardroom? You know what I mean? Um, Will they fit in, 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 in the Coast Guard culture? And uh, you know, some, some folks pass with flying colors and and maybe not so much other folks. Uh, So it is, it is very personality based. It's funny that you say that because when I was out at uh, JBLM in Washington, mm-hmm. Kevin Stokler actually hit yeah. me up because he was out in Port in, Angeles. Yep. Yeah. And there was a DCA guy coming from my brigade. And so he straight up hit me up. I hadn't talked to him in like years. He's like, hey, dude, it's Kevin. Yeah. Uh, What's this guy like? We got this dude that's coming from the army. He's from 16 Cab in Washington. Like, what's he like? Uh, you know, we're getting ready to have a meeting with him and stuff. And just curious, you know, what he's like as a dude, what yeah. to work with. And I was like, honestly, man, like, I don't know the cat, but. It's, it's a test to what you're talking about. Like, honestly, is this a good dude that's going to fit into our culture? Because you can pretty much train anybody for the most part, Absolutely. right? But culture is the most, like, critical portion of it, especially when you're talking about how familiar you guys yeah, are. So for sure. It's interesting. For Army guys that are, like, wanting to do that, it's an important thing to know. Basically, you know, be a good dude. Don't be a turd. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to get pre-screened. I mean, that, bring like that a, a, that's like a life thing. Just don't it be really a turd. Well, it, it is. Surprised, Some people know? lose like, sight of it, though, sometimes. sometimes yeah, right? it's, it's I think that like is you, Nick. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> go on, next question. Well, I know. I was like, I was like. Not that one. Not that My name also, Nick. We got two Nicks. It's fine. It's applicable to everybody. Sorry. All Nicks. It can apply to every nick dude sam and i are gonna fight after this all nicks are turds got it. <laughs> it's on. fine we're gonna i'm gonna find jason <laughs> quinn again and just have him just lift both of you guys yeah, up. Dude's he's, jacked. He's, oh, yeah he's a monster man yeah. yeah i was like he's over doing pull-ups off the air bus yeah. probably now yeah but no that's actually pretty cool so what, out of curiosity I, you know i briefly heard a little bit about your story prior to becoming a pilot uh-huh. uh do you want to touch on that a little bit yeah, so I joined the Coast Guard in 2006. I uh, knew I was going to be a Coast Guard rescue swimmer. My background was water polo and surfing. Grew up in Southern California, I can San Diego. See you being nice. I, I, I yeah. look at you and I'm like, man, he's a water polo. Well, player. what you see is my broad shoulders and good looks. Yeah, it's, that <laughs> in the, yeah. it's that in the mustache. It's yeah. that in the mustache. Exactly. And uh, you're picturing me in a speedo right now, which makes me not, not, no, honestly, no, I honestly, no, I, I don't know why. When I think of water polo, I think of like a guy in like a multicolor striped shirt. 
yes. with like like a one piece striped shirt. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. 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 No, we're no, we're just rocking speedos, dude. And, like, yeah, no shirts. Cap. Yeah. Oh, the, the, like it's like a wrestling cap. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Do you have the cap? Um, I, I do have it. Yeah. Actually, I have the Speedos too. And uh, in flight school, we did a, like a river float. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to rock the Speedo. Yes. And we're floating through like the panhandle <laughs> of Florida. So it's a little questionable. Um, but dude, I, uh, I was still looking pretty good. You're probably looking yeah. pretty good, dude. Um, but yeah, man, back to my story. <laughs> uh, I knew I knew I was going to be a rescue swimmer. That was my goal. Right. Um, and uh, the attrition rate at the time was probably 50 percent or greater oh wow and right now it's actually 75 percent attrition wow yeah so it's a challenging program to get into well it's not challenging to get into it's challenging to graduate um but um yeah so basically i went through the whole program um the way that worked was like four months of an airman program you go to an operational air station they kick the living shit out of you to get you prepared for a- aviation survival technician a school and then that was another about four months um, graduated and then um, went to uh, Air Station Cape Cod and then served down in Air Station New Orleans, which was a blast. That's a wild, wild place down there, man. Yeah, very, sure. very busy for search and rescue. And then uh, I was coming up on my 10 year mark and I was like, hey, I should either like get out, look at jobs on the outside or continue and continue on the Coast Guard. And uh, ultimately, I, I think I might be, maybe dropped like one application outside and I was like, my gut's telling me to stay in the Coast Guard. I like it too much, man. I, I like the people, the culture. And so I applied for officer candidate school and I knew I wanted, I wanted to be a pilot and I uh, got picked up. And so here I am now. Like That's awesome. It's yeah. cool, man. Um, I originally enlisted for six years. It's supposed to be four, but then the detailer, go, go, go coastguard.com. <laughs> it's like, hey, man, I'll make you an E3 right away if you sign up for six years instead. And I was like, yeah, I'm doing anything anyways, man. Might as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, dude, six, 16, almost 17 years. Here I am. That's wild. Yeah, Are you looking cool. forward to retirement? Uh, a little bit. So I have a family now. I came in single, you know, kids, obviously. And, um, Darn and, 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 yep. and you know what? Man, <laughs> things change, right? Life changes. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think I was going to be in the Coast Guard this long. So, uh, yeah, I'd like at some point I, I will retire. And uh, I don't know. But but I as long as the Coast Guards treat me well and I'm happy, I have no reason to leave. Yeah. You know what I mean? As long yeah, as you're absolutely. having fun, dude. Yeah, absolutely. You know, something I'm kind of curious about, um, because obviously, you know, you're a rescue swimmer and you've been a rescue swimmer and now you're a pilot and you kind of seen both sides of it. Uh, I would say for most of us, including myself and probably a lot of our listeners, the extent of Coast Guard knowledge is because they don't do a whole lot of movies on it. Uh, uh, I'll, yeah. bring up the Guardian. Outside oh, of the, the one Guardian. best movie, of probably all of all time. It's a great movie. Yeah. Yeah. Is, you a couple know, Oscars, I think it won, right? Absolutely. It was phenomenal. Was but uh, how, you know, for our listeners, how realistic is that portrayal? I mean, obviously, oh there was question. some cinematic additions there towards was. the end yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of like the process and the schooling and the culture, was that pretty spot on? They did a good job with that movie. And one thing I liked about that is that they brought in um, some of the Coast Guard's uh, uh, rescue swimmer instructors oh, nice. to facilitate and make sure like, hey, man, this is actually what we do, right? So a lot of what you saw in that movie was was accurate. And okay. some of that stuff was a little bit dramatic, right? You know, we're not going to hold on to our bud's hand and, you know, fly around in a helicopter or anything like that when the hoist cable breaks. I don't know. Maybe. I don't, who knows? Maybe it'll happen. Having um, to sit there and shred water, dumping, yeah. get five gallon buckets over yeah, your head. The ice tank it. Uh, so school, I'll, I'll say that uh, the one thing that was was a little bit exaggerated was the whole ice tank. And, hey, we're going to simulate hypothermia. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's really like appropriate. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But there, there was some other avenues that they were able to take to make us very, very cold. And I think they got the point across without having to sit in an ice tank. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah all I accurate. was curious it's about that. I was like, man, I was like, I don't really know how teaching someone or putting someone into a hypothermic state teaches them anything yeah. outside of you just made them hypothermic. I went through in the winter and um, the the course is in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, right on the Pasco mm-hmm. Tank River, uh, probably an hour from the Outer Banks. And, uh, you know, it gets chilly in the mid-Atlantic in the wintertime. I was actually pretty surprised. California boy is like, we'd show up, man, in our little cotton sweats and and just be just freezing out there, you know, because we get started 6, 30, 7 in the morning, something like that. Um, but they had one day where it's like, we're going to go all day and we're going to start first thing in the morning and we're going to start with a, a swim across the Pasqua Tank River and back. And it, it was full of activities. Anyways, at one point after having us do those sugar cookie back th- back there on the river um uh beach um they're like all right let's run back to the pool and the pool is like kind of warm 
dude, we were so cold. We jumped in that pool. It felt like a jacuzzi. Wow. You know? <laughs> it was a cool day, man. It was a, it was a fun day. They, they beat us up, but it was a fun day. That's awesome. And then in terms of the, in terms of like the rescues, obviously like, obviously the, the, the portrayal of the rescue is a cinematic yeah. piece. However, one thing I think that they, they did portray at least <clears throat> in a way is when you watch that, obviously, if you're a pilot, you're like, oh, wow, like this is like you would never fucking go fly in that. However, like from a cockpit perspective, like we've all th flown through some bad weather, likely you guys significantly worse weather. Yeah. And what I think is interesting is like how they portrayed it. Maybe you wouldn't have gone out in quite as bad or maybe you would have ended it up there. But in our heads, like when you're physically doing it, it's the worst weather you've ever been in in yeah. your life and you're yeah. facing it right then, right? Yeah. Um, do you guys have any experiences of, you know, some high risk? I won't say high reward, but high risk successes um, in terms of weather that you guys, you know, hit CRM right, hit planning right and went and like did some cool shit out over water, or, you know, wherever else in a rescue. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been... Uh, lucky in my weather uh, scenarios throughout my career because uh, you know I've had some nighttime offshore no illumination those have probably been my toughest ones um, but one of the best parts about our podcast is we get to highlight these crazy SAR cases and I don't know if you guys uh, saw the video of that boat rolling uh, in outside the Columbia yes. River like it was like two or so ago. yeah a couple yeah. weeks ago uh, oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so like that that's the weather that we go out and train in, uh, it, quite often. So like that specific case, like those are 30 foot breaking surf. Uh, the rescue swimmer who went down, his name is branch. It was his first SAR case. Like those, oh, wow. yeah, Dude. those, so like the mayday call comes in, uh, the, we're at this training school, the training limits, uh, are, we're, are exceeded. So we can't actually go out and train in it, but we got a crew for all the instructors. And then these guys are in this little shack just waiting to get picked up call comes in they're all like there's like eight rescue swimmers in there and they're just like hey who's gonna go so they like get the young guys together and they all rock paper scissors for it and this kid oh like, my god this kid, wins, awesome. this kid wins rock paper scissors and high stakes you know he he this is his first time going out in heavy surf this is his first time going through that course i mean if you watch the video he swims up to the boat the guy doesn't get off and then that that wave comes in he duck dives as much as he can but he gets rocked and then the helicopter picks him back up. The guy, like he flew off the boat. Um, thankfully, he had a life jacket on, courtesy of the uh, these this picture behind you with these uh, forty seven foot motor lifeboats. They got out Go there. Coast as well. Go Coast Guard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, uh, you know, in that weather scenario, those guys were prepared, um, and I think that's a testament to our training program. And then like the CRM too, like right, you know, like they everybody feels comfortable in their own spot, and they if they don't feel comfortable in their own spot, like they're willing to speak up. So I've never, I've never had a case where I've gone out and like really fell out of my limits uh, yeah. for weather. Like I have flown in a couple of hurricanes, um, and that that's probably been the gnarliest, just with viz thunderstorms and like. So really well, heavy well, when you say the weather, just so uh, some of our listeners, because if the Coast Guard guys will be like, oh, yeah, no big deal. You know, yeah. half mile viz and 200. Like, yeah, what you know, what is kind of when you say your weather limits, what for that is relatively normal or, you know, a lower risk for a Coast Guard guy compared to because us, it's like three miles viz, thousand feet. That's yeah. that's that's the, low the risk. The Coast Guard right? says that we can take off with quarter statute mile visibility. And that's it. Yeah. So no ceiling, just a quarter mile yep. viz. Um I, I mean, taking off, have you taken off on that? Because no. I, I so have a couple of times. I'll hit on this real quick. A lot of these cases, we make our go, no go decisions based off risk versus gain, right? So it depends on what the call is. Um, I'll, I'll add this. So if we, if the call is, hey, we have a, um, uh, let's see, a mayday call maybe offshore. Actually, that's probably a bad example. Um, what would be a good example of a of like a bogus case that maybe we would be questioned? Yeah, a so bit? I was uh, I was on duty. I, I was stationed in San Francisco before being in Mobile, and um, with a buddy of mine on duty, big cold front blasting through, and we used to get called for SAR cases out in the Sacramento River Delta. Um, so, like, kind of inland, you got to get over a couple, um, like, kind of the intercoastal mountain range, uh, power lines, all that kind of stuff. And it's like thunder and lightning. It's blowing 60, 70 knots. And the uh, the call comes in from the command center like, hey, we've got a uh, flare sighting. And the Coast Guard flies on a lot of flare sightings, which for good reason, right? Because that is somebody trying potentially trying to signal for help. And it might also be 
somebody on the side of the road seeing somebody else's yeah. brake light. It could be know. a firework and it could yeah. be Barbara, the condo commando, having one too many Chardonnays, thinking she's seen something up in Virginia <laughs> Beach. <laughs> I saw all the aliens. <laughs> that happens more frequently than you think. Yeah. But yeah. we have the ability. Like, that's an Shit. example. Like, yeah. So that that is a great example. Like, the flare sighting, right? It's like, we're like, we've all heard it before. We go and we fly. Now, is is it uh, high, high risk, uh, high gain? Potentially, right? It could be. Um, but unfortunately more, more often times than not, they turn out to be probably nothing. Um, one case, uh, I think I flew probably the, the, some of the worst weather. Um, it was a confirmed PIW person in the water, um, in, uh, Nantucket sound. So off of uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And basically they, it was a grandfather and his grandson sailing and the weather just went to shit. And the ceilings were probably like 200, 300 foot. Um, driving rain, very, very windy. Visibility was poor. And uh, we go, we're like, yeah, it's confirmed. Like the grandson said, my grandpa just fell overboard. There's a fireboat in route to uh, basically capture the sailboat because a grandson doesn't know how to basically drive this or, you know, sail the sailboat. So it's going somewhere. Um, and it's like, you know what? There's a dude in the water. He's, uh, I think, 67 years old and he does not have any uh, flotation and he's wearing yellow rain slicks. It's like, let's go, man. Like we have, we have the weather to do it. I think there's a, the, the, the reward is saving a person's life. So we fly out our flight mechanic spots him pretty quick. He's like, Mark, Mark, Mark. That's what we say when like, Hey, I'm gonna mark our spot. You guys probably have something similar, right? Yeah. And, um, circle around, boom, dude's right there. He's waving his arms. They deployed me. I was a rescue swimmer at the time, uh, popped them in a basket brought him back home man Dude, it was like awesome. man. it was like but it's one of those cases it's like yeah man we're going to we're, this is confirmed we're gonna fly yeah. flare case flare siding offshore and the dog shit weather i don't know man you know what i mean i mean you got to remember yeah, too that, like you, we're training in that stuff too like we'll go out and do instrument what we call instrument letdowns to the water but basically you just fly above whatever that layer is or you're in the goo uh to a point offshore and then we have a controlled approach down to a hover that'll hopefully get you out of the clouds on the way down so like we practice that a lot so that when that case comes in you feel good and you can do that or you're like hey like i'm pretty comfortable at 150 feet in this environment scud running out uh, luckily Unless there's like a wind farm out there, there's nothing over the water. Total, that's gonna total get nerd question. What do you file for? If you're going like, I mean, yeah. if you're, I mean, because obviously you're either, you know, VFR over the top on top, whatever. And then you're like, I'm going to punch in and just send it through the clouds. Yeah. So it'd be complete. Like, how do you, how do you, how does the FAA handle that? Yeah, that, that specific thing. That's a great question. So we, we usually file to a point uh, in space okay. offshore. Okay. Um, and then like, usually you just do your best to use plain language with uh, air traffic control at that point. Be like, Hey, uh, I'm going to lose radio uh, and you're going to lose radar coverage. I'm going to stay up the radio frequency and I'm going to send down here. I will call you on my way back up. And at least they can check like, Hey, is there anybody else around you? Um, we're the only idiots who are flying in like that class golf yeah. airspace yeah. offshore at night. Like nobody else is flying in right. that, uh, what, but we'll make some calls out on uh, like one twenty one five two forty three. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Then, what, what ATC could do is block off that airspace for us for a period of time. You know what I mean? To kind of deconflict. But yeah, like Sam said, I, I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. I've but, done it a couple of times. But when I do, I'm I'm planning on using plain language. Yeah. Basically, and, hey, active search and rescue case, Coast Guard rescue, six five, whatever. Yeah. Hey, we're, we need to shoot a approach to this point. It's you know, GPS lat long. Uh we're gonna do a letdown. We're planning on being there for approximately whatever, you know, and uh we'll be back up with you. Yeah. And so we I mean like Technically, we can't go if we're in controlled airspace, like we can't just punch in and out of radar contact, like and c continue down to VMC. So we have an exemption with the FAA, you know, like in our own like uh, airspace off the water out to about 12 miles uh, that allows us to do what we call these letdowns to, to get okay. to VMC. That like, makes sense because I was like, yeah. man, like. Yeah, so that's, that's wild. Right. And like there's a whole bunch of language in in some DOD publications too that I think it's like in that GP or the AP okay. um, that talks about uh, due regard. I don't know if you guys ever looked at that too, but so the Coast Guard kind of muddles the language with that, but it allows us to get down to wherever that case is. And, and that's why we practice it a lot too, to be safe. Now, you, the Coast Guard previously was under Department of Homeland Security, correct? It, it, it currently is now. It, is okay. now. it used to be DOT, Department of Transportation. Oh, DOT. Yeah. Okay, because 
now there are still some DOD directives that you guys have to fall under though, correct? In like a deployed environment, if yeah. you're operating like maritime oh, yeah. security. If we're, work, especially if we're working with like, you know, we work often with the Navy, uh, I think probably the most, um, and we'll, we'll follow their protocol, but like right. we go by Coast Guard pubs, then FAA pubs, and then like FAA DOD, and then DOD at the bottom, like DOD only pubs. So, but we all, I mean, we all went through Navy flight school. So like right. we, we already know kind of what it's like to be a Naval aviator. Right. And that's kind of, that's, so I guess kind of where I was leading with that is a lot of people like myself included, like for some reason I had thought they were pulling it slowly under the DOD more. And honestly, to me, it just makes sense, especially if you're, do, if you're doing port security in a deployed environment in the Middle East, which is, there are absolutely people doing that. Yeah. Like uh -huh. what's the, you know, why? Anyway, I digress on that uh, topic, but something on that note, you know, you guys train as naval aviators pretty much. And then you're going and doing these missions and everything from SAR to drug interdiction. Are you guys training, you know, a big difference in things that we do, obviously we get a mission set and pretty much whether you're flying med, air assault, maybe you're running, you know, just, you know, log runs yeah, yeah. or taking ammo, ass trash, whatever else it is. Ash yeah, trash. I mean, God, ass and trash, baby. Ass and trash <laughs> is a lot of what we do, but, um, you know, one of those big things is as you're doing that, Everything that we do in the back of your head, you're keeping in mind, you know, your environment, whether that's, you know, radar denied or, you know, enemy in the A, all that stuff. And we train react to contact. We train all these maneuvers. Are you guys similarly focusing on some of those near peer things that we find ourselves focusing on? I would say like hoisting probably the most, right, Nick? Yeah. Um, I mean, because we besides just flying around in the weather, like we're constantly hoisting all the time. Are you talking about like, what, what's our so I, training I, thing? Or? No, so I, I guess um, when you look at like the, kind of the focus of, you know, at least on the army side, I can speak for that because you know, yeah. we've been part of it. A lot of our training is shifting towards looking at, you know, near peer adversaries okay. and how we kind of go about that. But the reason I ask is given that you guys are, in your own way, still having to deal with people who have an increase in technology that are coming up from all these random countries and, you know, trying to push stuff into the U S are you guys focusing on, you know, shifting to combat some of the adversaries, newer technologies and, and systems and, and whatnot. If, I mean, obviously it's kind of a specific mission set and yeah. most of what you guys do is SAR, but I, I want to say the answer is yes. Um, it's not something that Sam and I do though. Yeah, right? probably right. not. As yeah. far as like countering, uh, new technology, emerging technologies. Now, um, one of the things that we do that is might fall into that category. We do have this thing called the scan Eagle, the basically okay. the fixed wing drone. Oh yeah. You guys yeah. heard of that? Yeah. I have. Okay. So they're, they, they deploy those aboard, um, some of our coast guard cutters for drug interdiction, migrant interdiction, um, some of those other things. And that 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 might fall in the category of counter countering some of these emerging technologies and kind of like tracking what's going on, or maybe just being a little bit more relevant with what's going on, right. in, you know, as a society or what's, yeah, you I, know, I, technology. I mean, nothing's coming after us except for some birds that we might run into. So well, like, you know, we're, not, just, we're not thinking a lot about that kind of stuff. That's what I was curious about, yeah. you know, because obviously. I'll be honest, if I was doing drug interdiction, I would be terrified that somebody was going to like turn around on the boat and start throwing, throwing rounds at the aircraft. Yeah, for sure. Which yeah. I mean, obviously, like you guys roll armed when, you know, you're doing those mission sets. I was just curious about kind of that focus. Um, but on the hoist note, you know, it's kind of good mm -hmm. that you bring that up because I know a handful of our listeners are med guys and um, shout out to Breeze Eastern, you know, for all of their hoist. I'm sure you guys probably yeah, have we've Breeze. Got, yep, sure do. Yeah, Breeze Eastern. Yeah. So for, for hoisting, are you guys doing dynamic? Hoist are just pretty much static. We're yeah, we're pretty good at dynamic hoisting and not knowing what dynamic hoisting is. I would say in our community, just because of <laughs> like you know, like you know, I think it's inherent in the way that we fly the sixty five because we're always out of gas and we're always underpowered. So like when we move in to do a hoist, uh, we're we're putting the basket down as we're sliding in, or we're putting the rescue swimmer down as we're sliding in, um, and then you do that inherent five second, seven second pause to like you know spit that person out or like disconnect the basket, put that person in and we go back to orbiting again. Right. Yeah. So, but we also do some, some static hoisting too. And I would say mainly in our um, cliff rescue program. So especially mostly on the West coast, you know, you've got a lot more cliffs out there. So we, we call it uh, vertical surface training, but that you're actually, you know, we use the, the hoist cable as like a static line that the swimmer remains connected to. And then you're, you're trying to hold a pretty steady hover for maybe, you know, 
what, like 10, 15 minutes, some of these cases, like they Absolutely, can take, yeah. it can take quite a bit of time. And yeah. like, there's, there's a lot of inland cases that, you know, the uh, local fire departments, they just can't get their ropes teams down to. Yep. And you very, know, very long hoist through trees. Yep. So we'll do, we'll do quite a bit of that. Um, and in those cases were, you know, we're just kind of in it, you know, you, you, you can't really kind of move in and out uh, as much, but I would right. say that uh, we are pretty good at dynamic hoisting. I, I, I say that from my own perspective, because I didn't know what dynamic hoisting really was and realized that that's kind of what, well, it's funny that you say do, that because there are you know? a lot of guys, a lot of older school guys in the army that when they, when they brought up dynamic hoist and there are units that still won't do it. They're like, Oh, it's dangerous because we're flying. I'm like, yeah, but in actual, in all, in all actuality, it's like one more safe for the, especially yeah. for the hoist rider, it's hundred percent more safe. And oh, yeah. too, if you're, especially on our side, if you're going in 90% of the time, the only time I'm going to do a hoist operation is if the person is stuck somewhere or on a rooftop or somewhere they don't really want to be or on the side of a mountain, Yep. you know, but in God forbid they're in a sked, we don't really, yeah, <laughs> that whole thing. But on top of that, I don't want to be at a static hover. But at the same hand, too, in any type of SAR situation in a non-combat environment, probably not going to need to do a dynamic hoist because you're they're probably going to be down into trees or yeah. you know in a cliff situation. Yeah. You for know, so for, just, for your dynamic hoisting, is one of the considerations losing an engine and not having fly out? Is that one of the reasons why you prefer the dynamic hoisting? Uh, so really, for us, it one it's speed expedience. Okay. Um, yeah. But then two, it's because you're pushing that zone of disruption you know, behind the hoist rider. So they're not, not they're, spinning. they're not spinning. Okay. You're basically eliminating the, like, you know, you're eliminating the spin. And while that doesn't necessarily matter, because most of the time we're putting down a single hoist rider, we, there are units that use baskets. I would say the majority of us don't, we yeah. have, you know, we have our JP and you know, your rider at most. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe sometimes they're throwing down like a sked basket, like one of the companies, has, uh, Vita Inclinata, has like their fancy thing with the jet engines yeah, and all that yeah, stuff, right? Cool. It's super cool, but yeah, you know, if you're doing hoist right, you don't need something that's going to counter spin, right? Because you're flying it appropriately. Yeah, I think for what we do, and specifically for like the water hoist, like we are doing multiple, like per, like for for training, right? Right. So going into like the dynamic hoist environment, like we are just burning gas. Like if we're going to pick somebody up, drop them, pick them up. Like that's, I, th I feel like that'd be hard to kind of coordinate yeah. in a it dynamic is, hoisting environment. Um, like Sam uh, uh, said earlier, like, yeah, we are limited on time. So everything we do is like, boom, 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 boom. And sometimes a lot of this is just for training purposes right. and getting the required amount of reps for like our know, flight mechanics or rescue swimmers or pilots, whatever. See, and I think it's interesting you, you bring that up specifically because, and I don't know, I don't know what the hoist rider program looks like on the coast guard and it used to not really be a thing in the army. And then the army was like, Oh, pff, hoist rider program. And I'm like, really just, we used to just put people could just go be on the hoist. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're on the hoist. Cool. You're going to go up and down. You're not just, <laughs> just put your, put your hands out. Go like, ahead. Yeah. Just connect to the right V ring and you know, keep your hand up. Don't let the hoist cable wrap around <laughs> your head. You're going to be fine. You'd be good. Um, but you know, in that program now they're like, okay, for you to be qualified as a rider, you've got to do, you know, 50 hundred or 50, 75 hundred or whatever, you know, your, your foot increments are in height okay. for that. And then, that you have to do full iterations of like a f these phases, like your in or out, your drop off, your pickup phase. So now it yeah. puts it, it binds you to training, having to drop them off rather than just, you know, doing yeah, up downs. Up downs. Yeah. Um, even though up downs would be a hundred percent faster, but yep. yeah, but no, it, it does bind them to that. But it's, I will say for our pilots, I would say a uh, vast majority, probably myself included suck at holding long hovers like that. Yeah. Um, because we're just, we just don't do it all that much. Probably the longest hover that we hold is either a hoist or a sling load. And most of the time a sling, I mean, they're usually pretty quick on the hookup. Yep. And when I, when I'm have the moment I have that thing down and I can get it off the aircraft, I, I don't want it anymore. It's like, cool, gone. Yeah, gone. Yeah. Um, but like fries and spies, those aren't long, you know, there's just nothing that requires that kind of crazy long hovering. So actually what I'm curious about with that is do your swimmers or, you know, your riders, whoever you're that rescue person, do they find that they like the 65 and its tendencies and those, you know, capabilities and environments more than the 60? There's definitely differences. Um, and, 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 and specifically in regards to the rotor wash. Right. right? Yep. So underneath the 65 rotor wash isn't too bad. Um, the pattern is a little bit different. The okay. rotors turn a different direction, you know, um, free falling out of it is different. Like when they, when they free fall out of a 65, 
um, that rotor wash kind of comes right down the side of the aircraft and it hits the surface of their fins and it tends to push you forward right into like oh, a place wow. plant position. Um, 60 is a little bit, maybe a little bit easier, but the rotor wash is like, you know, hundred miles an hour or something like that. Um, so I think those are the, some of the big differences now, uh, again, back to like pace 65 stuff. We do it a little bit quicker. We do quick briefs. We get in, we get out. Um, the 60 guys have a little bit more time to loiter. Um, right. so the rescue swimmers are like, if you're, if you're previously like a 65 rescue swimmer, you're like, what, dude, what is taking so right long now, right dude. now? Yeah. What are we doing? Um, so, uh, I think I'll just stop there. I think those are kind of the main differences. Yeah. 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 What's your typical on station time when you're either going out to train or when you find yourselves like going out to start, you know, looking for a, uh, I think, not a target, but like, you know, yeah, I think on a training sortie, like you're going out hoisting, um, probably 45 minutes of hoisting. It depends. Yeah. Like sometimes you have upgrade flights and, and we call it the clown car, but you put, uh, six people, you got two pilots, two max and two swimmers, uh, you know, one couple being instructors in there. Uh, but on a case we can be dude as little as like, Hey guys, we're going to get out there and we have five minutes before we have to turn around and we're going to land with 300 yep. pounds of gas. Yep. Gotcha. And like, so, and that, Luckily, like our, our new system in the in the Echo, we finally finally got cast. I don't know if you guys flew cast aircraft. I have. I know what it is, but okay. I, I don't. We don't have it. Well, some of the people in the army have it. Yeah. Yeah, and so like we we don't use cast like the DoD does, where like you guys are all time on target, right? Like you got to hit every single checkpoint at this specific time, or this bad thing happens, right? And uh, for us though, the uh, fuel management side of it is like you can say exactly what altitude what airspeed and everything that you're going to fly in that computer and it can it can spit it out really well i think like nick and i are pretty good at swag math in the aircraft just because we have to be with always being fuel limited but there are a lot of cases out there you get like three minutes and then you gotta you yeah. gotta ra- roll the yeah. the comfortable time limit it would be like 30 minutes to accomplish a deployment maybe a single recovery and getting the rescue swimmer back up and going back home like that's like when you think like hey man how much time would be nice 30 minutes is kind of like hey it'd be nice to have 30 minutes um but our 60 guys can they can usually loiter and sit on scene for quite a while i mean they got they got a six hour endurance normally um granted there are cases where like they've got to spit fuel out to like get get ready or whatever and that's wild are they running cefs and earths or like what uh, they've got uh i don't know what any of those words mean just like internal (laughs) and yeah Yeah, yeah, they they do have like two large internal tanks just behind the okay uh, gotcha that's our flight mix chair and then they have uh i think usually two 120 gallon tanks on the left side and then the the right side they'll they'll have like a 55 gallon uh for like the typical uh, configuration but they can throw a 120 on the right and get i think 5500 pounds yeah oh yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. I think 5,500 yeah. pounds is max gas for those guys, but yeah, they, yeah, they're stripped out there. They have a lot of, I mean, they're not quite as like reinforced in certain areas. They're just built a little, they're built different. They're built different. Yeah. Built different. Yeah. 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 Right. That's sick. What do you guys think of the 60? You guys love flying it or I love it. Yeah. Or I did love it. Do you, <laughs> do you miss it now that you guys aren't doing it anymore? I do. Bit. Okay. I do. You know, it's, it's been a really interesting, uh, transition and, uh, um, I, I flew fixed wing prior to, but I've never flown. I mean, outside of flight school, I've never flown any other helicopter outside of, you know, a Bell 206 and a Blackhawk. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I can't really imagine flying another, like, I don't have any desire to fly an Apache. I don't really, I think flying a Chinook would be pretty badass. Yeah. Um, yeah, that thing's awesome. But, you know, like, I think at the end of the day, especially as, you know, we walk around and we look at some of these new aircraft that are here, like the, the Airbus booth and you see just all these technologies. I feel like it's all just going to be increasingly similar, uh, especially when you're talking cast, when you're talking flight director systems and you're, you know, you just have all this technology that sure, like hand flying a helicopter is probably not going to be all that different unless you're flying like a little Robbie. Yeah. You know, I mean, hand fly in all reality, hand flying the, the bell is significantly different than a Blackhawk, but hand flying that bell is not going to be that much different from hand flying pretty much any other helicopter that doesn't have, you know, a mechanical mixing unit or all yeah. this advanced technology yeah. to make a aircraft, you know, it's army pilot stable. proof. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think like, if you take away the a flight director and the AFCS channels from most helicopters, you probably wiggle the sticks just like, you know, any right. other one. Any oh, other and one. that's the thing. And I'm sure that pretty much all of us have to go through and train that, you know, and, yeah. and have a little bit of that capability. Um, but I mean, really on our side too, I think the, the biggest thing that makes the Blackhawk really what it is and, and whether it obviously a Lima, uh, Alpha Lima side, a little bit older, not going to be quite a as great. Older. 
a lot bit older. It doesn't have all the systems to be very good at its job. I mean, it does, it does great at certain things, right? Like as a, as an air assault platform for like training and things like that, it forces pilots to, you know, maybe use paper products or paper maps and like do some old school stuff. The problem is, is that we're not necessarily in a situation that we need that. Like we produce all this technology and the ability to encrypt it and use that technology in the, you know, the most non-permissive environments in the world. Yeah. So like, why are we, why would we just revert and not try to use any of it? Right. But yeah. no, the systems on board are all designed for what you said. It's that time on target. Yeah. It's, you know, hitting, being able to manage fuel. Um, now the new Fox model Chinooks, most units are, are fielding, if not have already fielded CAS, uh, which is a trickle down from other communities within army aviation. Right. And obviously that provides significantly greater. It's impressive. Capa- I mean, yeah, it's impressive, dude. I sat jump seat on a Chinook and watched them like doing some cast, uh, cast work. And I just, I was lost. Yeah. I mean, I was like, I don't know. I understood what was going on, but, um, the amount of, the amount of data input that you can put into that thing from airspeeds, altitudes, exact, like everything is just wild. I think that's also like where we can screw ourselves though too. You yeah. know, like there's a lot of room for user error. Garbage in, right. there's garbage out. Yeah, garbage man. Out. Absolutely. And like, well, and that's what their junior pilots were, were seeing. They were finding them because, you know, they're trying to be the premier heavy air assault people of the world. You know, they want to, you know, the problem is they get so sucked into that yeah. that they, they start missing 15 other things because they're like, oh, well, I've got to get every parameter in the system that's going to fly this mission right. Yep. Yeah. Because it is. It's, it's basically now flying it for them that they, they, you know, you miss other stuff. And it's the same thing in the 60 community. You see people get sucked into the FMS and you see people, you know, get sucked into whatever. But I think these tools are great, but I don't know that it's going to be any different flying a 60 from any of the other ones when you start looking at the technologies and, and what's available to yeah. you, you know? I think um, the, the important thing that the Army is lagging on is like, getting some of our aircraft up to date like you look at all these guard units and even still some active that are flying the old lima model helicopters yeah how old is how old is that just in context 70s yeah oh I mean, shoot just, no way i mean it's all well okay most i would say most are 80s but i think some of the oldest ones are 70s okay it's, it's all analog stuff your gps is like the most unuser the 128 delta the 128 really delta. like i mean uh, yeah, you talk about like, like time fucking... intensive head inside the cockpit fucking with stuff yeah and then the 231s that we have for the radios which in the mic model is your backup head and you're really only using that if you're running satcom yeah it takes me way too long to change the frequency because i gotta switch it's like this 27 button push oh the stuff God. and so like, it's just up, like, down, up down left right left right x y x y <laughs> like something <laughs> triangle like, something that's easy as me hitting like one two two eight or a pre-store like this and being done i can even do it while still like an outside or whatever is yeah. way more time intensive shit like that and then you start talking about like just basic like flight director functions and stuff to help guys get out of shitty situations. Like if you've got spatial D or whatever, like we should be fielding that to our pilots. So that, right. like when they're in shitty situations, like, right. yes, we all train that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, sometimes shit happens and it's nice to have a system that you're comfortable and know how to utilize to help you get out of that. And the fact that there's still like a massive part of the fleet that doesn't have that capability. Man, that's I mean, really, it's that, pretty fucked it's, up. It's wild. Wild. It's and then wild. it's like, okay, well, we're going to wrap this all up into the, the Victor platform to save some money. So it's like, we're taking, sort of shells of the lima and like adding in an fms and stuff but i don't think that the flight director actually has like it doesn't have like any hold modes to, to no it's not, it's not it's a couple. To the axis or anything really so it's still like yeah. what is the point of this it's, it's a way for them to save money yeah. and modernize the art the existing lima fleet but so the you know kind of the overarching goal obviously like the army is definitely restructuring in a lot of ways and that's all that's a rabbit hole we won't go down yeah. but you know a big thing that is happening too is that they will get rid of the lemas yeah. over the next hopefully five years but probably 10 15 years they're going to get rid of those old aircraft send them over to your compo two and three guys which are your guard reserves and those guard and reserve units will then flip them into victors because it's the cheapest option to give them the greatest amount of technology but saving the most monies but it still doesn't give them anything that truly it doesn't give you anything like okay great you got moving maps now oh yeah we like all have it's like sweet we all yeah. have the fucking Four flight. DMBs that yeah. you issue yeah. us anyways yeah. and like I, I, the FMS I, is great, but like you said, they've been crunching numbers for fuel and all that kind of stuff in their heads already and doing simple math. Like we already know if we're going on a mission, how much fuel we need and stuff. Anyway. Yeah. So like that's a nice to have, but like the shit that they actually need that can help them get out of situations by coupling up or doing a go around and it all taking care of itself. It's not available still. Yeah. What, what so. would you guys say the, the uh, like army culture is for like flying and the instrument flying? Cause you guys predominantly people, people are afraid of it. And, yeah. and you know, I, I will say in the army, um, and we saw this a lot in Europe and I'm sure you have, you know, a lot of 
your own experiences. But the thing is that like from before you even anybody who's done a Europe rotation before you even go, they're like, we got to train instruments really hard. And, it, and it's true. You do because Europe in the wintertime is no joke. Like, yeah, especially in a limo where you're hand flying everything. Uh, and I hadn't been, I was in a mic model unit, uh, in the assault community for like five, five and a half years. And then when I PCS, I went right into a Lima unit and I hadn't, I hadn't flown a Lima since flight school. Yeah. And I was like, I haven't actually hand flown instruments in a long time. So you're going back in time, like, dude. Yeah. But, and that was eye opening too. Cause here I am, you know, pilot in command equivalent of an aircraft commander on your guy's side. And, and I'm like, I'm in Europe flying under the European rules, which are different, yep. you know, so you're learning those. You're trying to unfuck this 128 Delta and try to hand build an approach out and figure that whole thing. It's just, that was where I really saw exactly what Spence was saying and like how much workload this thing is because yeah. you're trying to hand fly. If you have an inexperienced or just a, a more junior person, especially with the Lima world, because nobody now gets trained in that until they get to a Lima unit. Yeah. So if you have a junior dude, you're trying to like talk them through flying or, you know, whatever on the GPS because they don't have an, the experience hand flying to be able to fly in moderate icing January yeah. in fucking Poland, you know? So yeah. it's just, it's a whole, it's a whole thing, but it's, it's a significant enough issue that, uh, you know, we just did a video on it not that long ago. The guard is getting, you know, the, uh, LUH 72 Bravos. They literally took the Lakota and they were like, Oh, Hey, like this is a, a widely used for these mission sets and these systems are going to help them. So they immediately are fielding, you know, the Bravo model that has those hold modes that has, you know, the recovery functions that the Mike model has. Yeah. But yet we still have people performing those mission sets that don't have that. I don't know. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Obviously you can see we're relatively passionate about yeah, this. No, because it's important. Well, people are still losing their lives as a result of yeah. not having that equipment. And, and they're obviously, you know, there are, a lot of people might say, well, you know, it could be pilot air, it could be X, Y, and Z air. Yeah. But if they're still flying a fucking aircraft from 30 years ago, when there's no reason that we can't have the newest stuff, you know, like, what's, what's the point? You're like, well, why, why don't we? Yeah, why, well, exactly. Why like, don't we have it? It's frustrating because it just shows that like, we're not, they don't really care about the, the people, right? Yeah. Like, you're just yeah. another serial number in a book type of deal. Like, yeah. If you truly probably care, makes you want to get out. It you would know, be like, right. and, and those people and giving yeah. them the technology they need to help yeah. keep them yeah. safe and perform yeah. their jobs more proficiently. And to go back and answer your question, I think it's very situationally dependent on which organization organization you're a part of when okay. it comes to IFR training and stuff. And I, I like to caveat this with like, I'm not a super experienced pilot. Like, so, you know, my, my, my experience is very limited, but when I was out at JBLM, granted, like, very seasons, mountain snow, a lot oh, yeah. of weather and stuff. We flew instruments every training flight. We typically would go out like multi ship and do like our time on target shit, get lunch or dinner somewhere or whatever, break up and then come back IFR. And yeah. so we train it every day. And and another organization that I was a part of, you know, it was a previous OH fifty eight Kiowa. And like for them, an instrument approach was an emergency, emergency. procedure. Yeah. And a lot of those older guys, like they fucking hate the clouds. They don't want to train instruments and stuff. And yeah. so it was like it wasn't really being trained all that lot. And you had a couple of guys, you know, a couple of SPs that were like very well versed in it and everything. But just like we talked about earlier, when you've got 17 other jobs and shit, a lot of times the only chance you really get to like learn from to fly with your SP is once a year for your fucking, yeah. you know, proficiency check ride yeah. and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's like being able to train and implement those guys. I think it's, uh, you know, it just depends. Yeah, so we, I think I think some units are really good about making sure that there's that they're good at it, and others are, you know, unfortunately not trained as much as they probably should. Yeah, be. we've got a mantra that uh, it's essentially aggressive, safe training saves lives, and I think that applies to us being able to go out and save people that need help, and it also applies to us being able to save our own lives in the case of like going double IMC or something. So like, you know, we're we're definitely, we had a whole period during COVID where we didn't have a lot of parts. We were cutting back on flight hours. People weren't getting the time, like especially the new guys, like the time that they needed to become proficient and progress in their syllabi. Um, and it's just so like, we, we foot stomp this a lot. It's like really important that you go out. If you're going to go out on a flight, like put a little bit of time and effort because it Absolutely. might be your only one flight during the week. Right. And like go fly in the clouds if it's a good cloud day. And if you have a flight director, like kick off the flight director and hand fly in the clouds. Absolutely. So, you know, like you can do that when that, that shit hits the fan and you're not, you're, it doesn't make you nervous, you know? And we, you know, we say the same thing because, um, it's funny you bring that up having in the, in the salt world, I never thought much about flight hours, you know, smaller company. We usually are very busy fly all the time, but in the med world, 
I found it. And it, it's again, very unit specific and it's, it's all going to vary, but you know, in my particular unit, there's just a lot of people on that ATP or like the actual, yeah. you know, that fly best part of the company to include staff aviators at the higher levels that are flying with the company. And there's all these people. So the flight hours are actually pretty limited for some of the junior guys. And, um, you know, a lot of us say, Hey, like you have to maximize every little hour that you can. So like going to fly to get food may sound like it's a great thing, but how about you build out like this scenario and plan yeah. and do X, Y, or Z. Let's, let's find the edge of your comfort zone and kind of sit on it. Yep. And because that's where you grow. And especially when you start to see people get stagnant, maybe they're ready to be an aircraft commander or pilot in command. Um, but if they don't like find those lines and de- continue to develop, they're just going to just going to stay there. You yeah. Know? Whenever you think you're done learning, get out. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like that's just you should you should always be like willing to learn something new in the aircraft. Yep, absolutely. And I'm gonna continue to fuck things up in the aircraft. Like it's gonna happen. But yeah, I, I do. I don't know. I, I think it's one of those things where I don't know. I, how is your time? I mean, it's different on the warrant side because obviously our primary job is to fly. But on the O grade side, you probably have a little bit different experience with that because you were at the staff level and you saw kind of what it was like to try to have the expectation of accomplishing the same mission set proficiency, everything else as somebody at the company level. And that's the big thing that's probably different with the army yeah. and in probably the coast guard is like, if Spencer is working a staff job, he could be working a staff job with some ground unit and still be on our ATP and they could throw him on an air assault yeah. and be like, Oh, Hey, you need flight hours. Here you go. And he would still be expected to perform and do everything as though he's been the dude flying, you know, two times a week. And it, it's just, like sweet. Yeah. Yep. That, I had a little big experience with that coming back from deployment um, and going back to staff after being in the company. And I was fortunate enough to be a PC. So I was able to get down to the company level and fly a little bit more. But like you said, it's not every week, more like once a month type of deal. And yeah, it's like, Hey, well, dude. he's a PC, bring him in and pull him in and throw him with this cherry dude. I'm like, bro, I haven't really like flown I a lot. Like, the sticks I'm not very man. proficient right yeah. now. So yeah. I got this guy that's about to punch us in an inadvertent go uh-huh. pattern. And it's like, you know, so it's not there's a good. definitely some organizational like structure challenges between the O grade and the warrant officer house and just how army aviation is sort of structured that I right. think can complicate some things and yeah. make it challenging to be mm-hmm. proficient on top of just already like having enough money to fucking train in general and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. It, it's, it can be a unique challenge for some people, for sure. I think we all have yeah. those, for sure. Yeah. So something that we typically do uh, on ours, I'm sure you guys do something very similar, is with everybody that we have, and since we've had both of you here, we definitely we want to hear from both. If you have any piece of advice, and I will say specifically for this, because we try to usually tailor it towards that people, those, per, those people's experiences or whatnot. If you have any kind of advice for somebody that is either a search and rescue pilot or wanting to get involved in that mission set or, you know, that's, or they want to go into Coast Guard aviation for that matter, uh, AKA go coast guard.com. Go coast guard. Right here. Go coast guard. Yeah, go go coast coast guard. <laughs> no big deal. Uh, just, uh, the sponsor of today's episode is go coast guard.com. <laughs> uh, you know, what would your piece of advice for them be, uh, whether that's on, you know, how to be successful or whether that's just in terms of expectation management, uh, you know, what would that be? Do you want to start with this on Nick or? Uh, you can start with this one. I'm going to give okay. this a little bit of thought. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the first thing that pops into my mind, I think this is more for like, if you're already in the industry, you're already flying, uh, be hungry, be humble. Um, because I think like both of those, and it's, it's really simple, a few words, but like, I think that uh, it, it adds a lot of value to you continuing to launch your own career and always progressing and getting better. Um, and then, you know, like obviously being hungry, trying to get to the next thing, but being humble, there's, there's no buddy out there that, uh, you know, doesn't know a pilot who isn't humble. And like, you're like, you know what, I, I don't really like flying with that dude. You know, I don't really want to hang out with that person and they might be a shit hot pilot, but like, they're the one who's probably going to make that mistake. And, yep. and they're not the one that anybody feels comfortable saying like, Hey, like Dude, you, that's terrifying. You screwed up. Right. And that's terrifying. So like be hungry, be humble for sure. Uh, but if you're, if you're interested in like specific search and rescue, I think you can't find a better organization than the coast guard. And like you said, go coast guard.com you say that a million times, but like, <laughs> yeah, like ch- check it out. Like you will cut your teeth in some really, really cool areas around the country. Uh, you're going to get an opportunity to fly in some environments that 
uh, a lot of companies that are here at HAI would would really value, uh, especially if you're looking to do it on the outside. Uh, so it translates really well into the industry. Like obviously hams, like we all can go fly hams, but you want to go do some hoisting at a county sheriff office or or fly uh, firefighting and all that kind of good stuff. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely does. Yeah. Um, I might parallel Sam's uh, comment there just a little bit. What we do for maritime search and rescue is very, very rewarding. Um, it is not easy work, right? Uh, it's not fun sometimes. Uh, there's times where you're on duty and maybe it's your eighth duty of the month and the SAR alarm goes off at two in the morning. And you're like, dude, I just wanted to have a quiet night. <laughs> and the weather is dog shit and you're not really excited about it. When you go out though and you find that person in the water and you hoist them or you go out and you're called out for a medevac and there's a injured shrimp boat captain with a um, amputated leg and you bring him back to the hospital and drop them off safely back on land dude that's a good feeling and you can you can run with that high for a couple months you know what i mean you're, absolutely it pumps yeah. up you know the individual the entire crew uh the unit gains from it uh we use these stories you know we discuss these things pass down these stories so people can learn from them um, but, uh, I'll, I'll leave with that. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's very rewarding. It's not always easy. Uh, if you're up for a challenge, like this is a good job if you're uh, up for the challenge. Yeah. Go coast guard. Go go coast guard. <laughs> yeah. Where, where can uh, our listeners find you guys? Go coast guard. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you team me up. Spence. That was good, dude. No. So actually uh, well, we, we can dive into that. So, in all um, yeah. Yeah. Flight suit Fridays yeah. is, you know, we appreciate you guys hanging out with us. Yeah. Uh, I know this This is going to be live on both of our medians, you know, mediums, yeah. b- whatever. Words. Uh, yep. Words, hard things, yep, HAI. Um, so this is going to be up on both, obviously. But if our listeners on the pilot signs want to find you guys, are you guys on Instagram now, right? Yeah, we got Instagram. Uh, if you type in Flight Suit Friday, just in Google, you'll come up. But you were on like every single podcasting thing you can, or any of the big normal ones. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah, Spotify, yeah. Apple, uh, Google, whatever it is called. Sick. Are you guys on YouTube? Uh, definitely not. On, are we on YouTube? No YouTube. No, no, no YouTube. YouTube. Okay. Nope. Only cool. social media right now is Instagram. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah. Then for our guys, make sure you check out and we'll share their stuff on, you know, on the pilot and on Brutalian. Uh, but be sure to check out flight suit Fridays again, big thanks to shot over for having, uh, the pilot and Brutalian down here as well as go coast guard.com, AKA the coast guard and the flight suit Friday guys for hosting this amazing podcasting booth and the ability for us to, to be able to hang out and uh, get to meet some awesome people and come do something we love at an expo with about $200 million worth of so uh, aircraft. Here. Incredible. So, so cool. Yep. But uh, yeah, outside of that, Spencer. One last thing and not to dime you guys out, dime but uh, talking DCAs and just maybe other guys and gals who are interested in going that route. Would you feel comfortable if they like hit you up? DMs on the social media to Absolutely. share a little knowledge and Absolutely. You know, insider trading. Would love awesome. that. So there you go. Yeah. Sweet. Anytime. Cool. Yeah, guys, thanks. Thanks so much for having us, man. You guys have a great thing going. It's been a blast. We need to do this. Uh, no, again we, we definitely, we definitely do. Again. I think we also need to um, somehow make a be hungry, be humble shirt for yeah. Flight Suit Fridays thanks, to happen yeah. and uh, and get that out there. I think that'd be pretty awesome. And and those are some words to live by. Yeah. So absolutely. Sweet, guys. Thanks. Sweet. Word. Thank you.